Hello there once again and welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're glad you decided to join us this morning. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And today we have, uh, or welcoming back, a, a, a frequent visitor to The Verdict, but a guy we just never can't have on enough. Well, that's right. Harold Hamm, the uh, Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of Continental Resources, is coming on to visit with us again about what's going on in his company. They've made some big announcements recently that are going to impact the city of Oklahoma City. And uh, we're really pleased that Harold would give us his time to come back and tell us what's going on, not only with Continental Resources, but kind of in the oil and gas mm -hmm. industry generally. And uh, anything that's exciting to him or uh, troublesome to him, that's we'll, right. we'll try to find out about. One of many, but one of our most successful businesses, certainly an emerging giant in the energy industry, both well, individually and as a company. Exactly, excuse me. But mm -hmm. uh, he's also, I should say, a very uh, uh, giving of his time and his resources uh, to charities such as the Diabetes yeah. Foundation. And today he's giving his time to us and we hope you'll enjoy our visit with Harold Hamm. It's coming up on The Verdict. America has been here before, faced with daunting challenges, and we've always found the courage to lead. Foreign oil greenhouse gases we have the power to do something about them with american natural gas chesapeake is forging ahead converting our fleets to clean burning natural gas vehicles encouraging others to do the same welcome to america chesapeake america's champion of natural gas we'll see meyer eatman tate we're accountants we do taxes business valuations estate planning and consulting and we're right here in Oklahoma working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa I bow my head to pray I know you hear each word I say I'm pouring out my heart to you like water I have faith I have faith I have faith in you Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. And Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today we're really pleased to uh, welcome back to the set of The Verdict an old friend, Harold Hamm, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Continental Resources. Uh, he's been uh, in those positions with Continental since 1967 when he founded the company. Uh, he is also a Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of several other oil and gas related businesses, some in the service industry and, and the like. His company has just announced a, a major move of uh, his company headquarters from Enid, Oklahoma to Oklahoma City. We want to talk to him about that. Uh, he and his wife, Sue Ann, have been uh, principal donors to uh, the uh, Harold Ham Diabetes Center uh, under construction or recently under construction. I'm not sure whether it's been completed or not, but it's a wonderful facility for the treatment and research into the treatment of diabetes. So he's not only a very successful business person, he's a very big giver uh, to uh, uh, charities that need help, and he is not uh, reluctant to help. It's his second visit to The Verdict. We sure welcome you back. That's good to be here, Kent. Thank, thank you very much. Harold, well, great to have you back on the show. Since you were last on the show, you've, uh, it's become public a, a lot of changes that are taking place inside your company, including growing some businesses in Enid and relocating uh, the headquarters of CR in Oklahoma City. Can you kind of give people a capsule of, of the decisions that have been made by the board? Well, this was a, a decision that took a long time to make, and a lot of thought was given to it. Uh, in all sincerity, it took uh, years, not not months. Uh, we. we find ourselves in, in a very rare situation. Our growth rate, uh, we announced this year, is 35, 37 percent. Mm. Our company is heavily involved in the development of the huge Bakken field in North Dakota and Montana, and have been for several years, uh, been involved with it. And as we develop that field, we found ourselves in a situation that we 
are needing to grow very rapidly. We've announced uh, plans to grow triple our company size in the next five years. We did that last year, and we're well on the road to doing that, to accomplishing it. But it's, uh, we, we need a lot more people. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's a very rare circumstance that we're in with our company that growing that fast that we can't attract that m many folks to a rural area as Enid is. So Enid's been very good to us. It's uh, been our home for an awfully long time. And, and uh, we've enjoyed Enid and all the folks there, and we're going to miss them. Uh, but we, we are leaving some companies there, mm -hmm. and uh, they're not in the same situation that Continental is, so uh, they're, they're very much at home, and uh, we're not going to bother them. Can you d discuss what you've learned through the years on growth? Because you have grown this company uh, exponentially, and uh, do you get better at, at handling growth, or is it always a challenge? It's always a challenge. Uh, you know, it, it's all about people, and it's a culture in itself. Uh, growth, growth is, and so yes, I've always been involved with growth companies. Uh, and I, I don't know, you never get really good at it, but uh, <laughs> there there are challenges, but. You know, you learn to handle those and uh, get the right folks in the right mm -hmm. place and the right seats on the bus and mm -hmm. and keep the bus going the right direction, doing all the right things, and, and that can happen. Well, so. are there other CEOs or other companies that you've seen through the years that you thought, you know, they handled their growth really well and there might be a thing or two we could adapt and, 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 and incorporate here? Oh, gosh, we're, we're moving into the building of, of one of those people, uh, Larry Nichols, John Nichols, uh, you know, Larry told me when they moved into Devon building that they had less than one floor. <laughs> I <laughs> remember that. <laughs> and now they're, they've grown out of the building and there's, you know, populating place all over town. And, right. And building the largest building in Oklahoma. And so, yes, uh, you know, I, I admire people that have grown mm -hmm. companies uh, right here at home, like Larry Nichols. Do you consider yourself a risk taker? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, you know, to uh, have growth companies, you're a risk taker. You're out mm -hmm. there, uh, you know, uh, plowing a, a, a new furrow <laughs> and doing a lot of things that hadn't been uh, done before, thinking about a lot of things that pe people hadn't thought about. And mm -hmm. certainly the Bakken is one of those. It's such a, a large uh, uh, resource but the, the challenges that that field took, the new technology that had to be developed to, to obtain that resource had just been tremendous. So it means so much to me as an explorationist uh, to work in, in, with something like that. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a, a, you know, one of, the, one of those things that sure, it's a, it takes a, a lot of risk. A lot of risk is involved. Errol, I was particularly impressed with all I knew, all I know is about the news reports, but particularly impressed with the efforts that you and your company made to make the move uh, from Enid to Oklahoma City as, as easy as possible on the employees, but also as easy as possible on Enid and the economy of Enid. Can you describe mm -hmm. some of those? What were your thoughts there? Well, we, ha we have some other companies, uh, even though they're staying in Enid, they're our growth companies, uh, Highland Partners, uh, uh, completing the services and, and uh, other companies. And, and of course, uh, they, they have challenges as well. We have some folks that, uh, that can't move uh, with us due to their spouse and uh, uh, an occupation that, uh, that, that they can't move, but some of them are going to work for those companies and, and providing uh, resources uh, allowing those companies to grow as well. So yes, it's a, you, you have to take a lot of things into mm -hmm. consideration. And, and, uh, but Oklahoma City has uh, just rolled out the red carpet for us and made it easy uh, you know, to come here in this community. Uh, you know, there's been uh, folks come out and tell us all about the schools, uh, all about features all over Oklahoma City. Uh, mayor's been uh, very kind and gracious to uh, Welcome us to to Oklahoma City, and and so we hate to hate to leave Enid, but it's a uh, it's it's uh, will be a very nice easy transition. What, what, were you approached by other cities? Were uh, you know when when energy companies uh, 
tend to expand or want to relocate, that there's a, there's a lot of drive to Houston and a lot of drive to go to Dallas. And we've seen Oklahoma companies make that route. Um, what was your thought process about relocating your company into a position where it could grow to the extent that you thought it could grow? Well, we wanted to uh, take our uh, company to, to within a community that that uh, had the, the same culture and pr principles that we have, and we feel like Oklahoma City is the best fit. Even though two thirds of our uh, work and uh, resources are, are in uh, in the Rockies, uh, we considered Denver, uh, but you know it just uh, it just wasn't quite the same. Right. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> let me ask you about. I know that the average employee for Continental Resources is a pretty skilled person, uh, with uh, perhaps some uh, education requirements that aren't the norm. Do you Not think professionals? Uh, professionals, indeed. Do you think that's going to be easier to recruit? To, for Continental Resources people to come here and be with your company in Oklahoma City than might have been the case if you hadn't moved? Well, this, uh, you know, the brightest stars that's coming out of college today, I mean, uh, you know, they're, we have people waiting in the wings to hire those folks. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's going to be a lot easier to attract them if we're located in Oklahoma City than it is, you know, if, if we're in Enid. Uh, is what it comes down to. We have a lot of people want to live, you know, in, the, in that setting. You know, you have great quality of life and, and everything there, but, uh, you know, some people are, you know, just, they want to be in the metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an urbanization going on all over the world. There certainly is. It's not is. just in Oklahoma. Yes. A lot of people are moving to cities. Harold Hamm is our guest. He is the president and CEO of Continental Resources, uh, recently announced a relocation of their corporate headquarters from Enid to Oklahoma City. Got other businesses around the state and around the United States. We're going to have more with Harold when we get back. The thing that has made the most sense for me is realizing that I am still an educator, and that is what I do at the Chickasaw Nation. I'm Dr. Amanda Cobb-Greetham, I'm a historian, and I'm Chickasaw. The Chickasaw Cultural Center is amazing. It is a very, very special place devoted to the sharing and to the celebration of Chickasaw history and culture. State-of-the-art technology, exhibits that are not like anything I've ever seen. The Spirit Forest is incredible, and you feel as if you have actually just walked into a forest with huge trees all around you. It's timeless, and yet it's sort of also representative of our time depth, to really just sort of reach through time and touch the past. By the end of the exhibits, you really have a sense of Chickasaw cultural and political resurgence, and the extent to which we are a healthy, dynamic, and vital tribe today. Chickasaws have always been an inclusive people. This is something for the whole community and for the state of Oklahoma. In 25 years, world energy demand will grow by 44% with oil and natural gas largely meeting the need. The question is, will America's demand be met by American resources? Oklahoma says yes. We're developing the largest oil and natural gas discoveries America has seen in 40 years. It's creating jobs and millions in tax revenue for schools, roads, and hospitals. Oklahoma's oil and natural gas industry, advancing our state, empowering our nation. When you have something important to communicate, it becomes clear that there's a lot of competition for your audience's attention. So how can your message stand out and actually resonate with your audience? Legal Graphics has the answers. The team at Legal Graphics will work with you to plan, design, and even test your presentation to ensure your message will be heard and remembered. Call Legal Graphics today to schedule an appointment. The readiness is all. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. We're visiting with Harold Hamm. We talked a little bit about the, the Balkan Shale and, and the investments that your company have made in, in that part of the country, in North Dakota and Montana primarily, and that part of the Rockies. Can you describe to someone like me who, who is not a petroleum engineer exactly the new technology that's allowing the exploration to take place so successfully? Sure. Uh, you know, as a geologist, we all know that uh, the oil and gas come from the source rocks, and source rocks are the shales. And we have two shales up there, the upper and lower Bakken shales. 
uh, within Wilson Basin, and these were very thick at one time, four or five hundred feet thick, and they've been lithified down or compressed down uh, to where they're maybe 15 to 50 foot thick, some sometimes places 75 foot thick. And this is buried at about 10,000 feet. That seems pretty deep. It is. It's, it's fairly, this is a pretty, this is a deep basin. Which means it's expensive to get, I would assume. It, it's, it's fairly expensive to get to. Uh, but it's encapsulated. Uh, encapsulated but b below uh, what we call the lodgepole limestone. It's a very thick limestone that just caps it. And then underneath it, we have a, another zone called the NISCU, uh, which is a salt bed zone that basically encapsulates uh, uh, the Bakken shales between uh, those two. And the, uh, below the first Bakken shale, there's a dolomite uh, zone. We call it the middle, middle Bakken dolomite. And that uh, extends across the basin below the upper shale. And then the three forks uh, below the lower shale and this oil as it uh, was expulsed from the, the shales themselves, uh, it, it increases in, in volume by almost double. And so as it, as it came out of that shale, it, it went down into uh, both the uh, dolomite section and the uh, three forks section and became oil saturated within those. And it's, it's the low perm rock uh, but we're not drilling the shales themselves, we're drilling in these other reservoirs, and it's low perm rock, so it takes horizontal drilling uh, within those uh, formations. We're drilling both in the dolomite and the three forks as far as two mile laterals. Wow. And then we're putting a malt, we're treating the rock with multi stage uh, frac. Uh, job so it's just kind of bite-sized fracks all the way along that lateral and these these wells come in very nicely and and uh, with this technology mm -hmm. and maybe the average uh, our average well up there is about 518,000 barrels that will it'll make over the life of the well ultimate recovery mm -hmm. per well how new is this technology could this have been done 10 years ago uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, it wasn't being done. Uh, we, we began drilling uh, the Bakken about 10 years ago now in the Montana side in the Elm Cooley field, and there it didn't require fracking. Uh, so it was just putting a lateral in place of up to two miles, and, and uh, uh, the wells would uh, produce. Uh, it didn't, it didn't uh, require the multi-stage fracks. It required fracking, but not multi-stages. Mm -hmm. We're putting as many as 30 stages in these wells now. And, but there we could just frack one stage and it'd go where it would and, and, it, and it was commercial. In North Dakota, it wasn't like that. It took the multi-stage frack technology. So uh, we migrated into it when we went into North Dakota in, in 2003, drilled the first well there in 2003, 2004, our company drilled it. On a given, given day or given time period, how many wells would you have active up in that uh, in Montana? We, we, have, uh, we have 24 rigs running up there today uh, and in the Bakken. And so that's a lot of activity. How many wells have you completed up there? Uh, about 400, uh, approaching 400 wow. uh, wells in the Bakken. Yeah. Now we've got a lot more wells up there in uh, uh, Red River B and, and some other formations. Uh, uh, but anyway, our, our company is uh, the largest producer uh, up there in the Wilson Basin. Well, what's your expectation if you, you've got the, the leasing rights you need and you're, you're going after it on the exploration side? How long can you be active in exploration before you run out of sites to drill? Well, we will be uh, active a long time. <laughs> uh, we'll hold all of our leases over about the next three years with this. Uh, and we'll ramp up our rig activity some more, but uh, be able to hold all of our leases. Uh, and this uh, large spacing units, there's space 1,280 acres. Mm -hmm. And then we'll infill, uh, drill, uh, the rest of it. With our company, only 13% of the drilling has been accomplished so far. 
So we're just started. And how many employees do you have up in those fields? Uh, our company has uh, about 500 employees, about half of which are uh, located uh, in Enid, about 275 people at this time in Enid. Uh, and so the rest of them are up in mm -hmm. the field. Yeah. The yeah. price of the pump has gone up. Do you have a, a reason? Can you? Can you tell people why the supply and demand is, is creating a higher price for well, gas, uh, gallon of gas? Well, supply makes all the difference with demand, of course, and demand has gone up with uh, uh, the, the Chinese uh, development, uh, you know, and, and increasing demand uh, in Asia. But the, uh, you know, the, some of the supply has been hurt, you know, with the moratorium in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of oil coming out of the Gulf, and and you know, the moratorium on all that drilling, there's just nothing uh, going on there to speak of now. So that's, uh, that, that took a lot of supply away. And, uh, and then there's a lot of uh, federal lands that's uh, off limits. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you, you, uh, you start eliminating supply and pretty soon you've got a $5 gas price. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, we're, we're price takers, we're not price makers. But you know we've uh, we're, we are increasing U.S. supply, and have been for the last five years, even as a result of, of the uh, the Gulf uh, mor drilling uh, moratorium. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, actually, our imports are down. We're only importing about 47 percent now, and producing 53 percent. This this is by EIA numbers. This is by government uh, data. So, we're doing our part. Yeah. Uh, Hasn't traditionally uh, the uh, percentage been reversed? I mean, that we were importing more than we were producing. You know, yesterday. today we're supposed to be importing 70 percent. Uh, we that that was what was forecast that we would be importing. Uh, well, we're down to 47 percent. So we we've, we've made a huge turnaround. Mm -hmm. The new technology uh, that's produced uh, an overhang of supply of natural gas. Uh, we have uh, maybe a century of natural gas supply now. And uh, of course we, we get natural gas liquids from that and that, that, uh, that helps on the supply side of uh, liquids and crude oil. So, and plus, you know, with all the uh, crude oil drilling that we're, we're doing in the Bakken and, and some other uh, oil producing fields, uh, you know, we're seeing that supply come up. Let's get away from the oil business just for about the last minute we have here on the show and tell us about what's going on with the Diabetes Foundation and what you're involved with there. Well, uh, you mentioned construction. We're, we're not constructing right now, oh. so we're done with the construction side and got some wonderful facilities uh, both on the uh, uh, adult and, and children's uh, side both. At the and Health Sciences Center? Yes, at the OU Health Sciences Center. I uh, got about two floors of researchers, uh, investigators, we call them, that are uh, busily at work. Uh, you know, our mission is to find a cure for diabetes. Uh, we, we know that's a real tall step. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, a big challenge, and we're, we're after that. Uh, we've appointed a, uh, a large board, about 35 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mayor has graciously uh, come aboard. Uh, he wanted to be a part of that. And we had our first meeting recently uh, with the board, and it was a, it was a great meeting. Uh, and also, uh, along with the board, we created a, a foundation. And uh, uh, Sue and I uh, put the first money in it, a $20 million dollar uh, grant uh, from us uh, to the foundation to really get off the ground. We hope to build that foundation to about $100 million, and uh, I think we're well on the way to get started to do that. Good. Harold Hamm, our guest. Harold, thank you so much for what you're doing for the state of Oklahoma. Yeah, that's great work you're doing. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. And Kent and I will be back with a final word when we get back. comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. 
a place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political government and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers, and we're wrapping up a show with Harold Hamm. Harold's doing great work in the business community and in the private charitable community as well, and we're grateful for all of that. Such a positive influence on this state. Indeed. And you can get more information on Harold and his company by going to their website. It is contres.com. That's C-O-N-T-R-E-S.com. C-O-N-T-R-E-S.com. We'd also appreciate it if you go to our website and tell us about a show or a guest that you'd like to see us visit with here on The Verdict. Our website is theverdict.tv. That's theverdict.tv. Next week, we'll have the governor on The Verdict. Mary Fallon will be here. That should be a special time. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We will see you next week in that very special show right here on The Verdict. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.